Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm here with the multi-talented Axel Carolyn to talk about her new film, The Manor. Thank you for joining me today, Axel. Thank you for having me, hi. Okay, uh, so Axel, your film seems to really comment on the way our society worships youth, uh, the way we seem to be all too quick to discard the elderly, and also fears of aging. Did anything in particular inspire you to tell this story? Yeah, I think this is something that's always scared me and always bothered me, and and not just not just for when you end up in your later stages of life, but like at every stage in life, you're kind of judged according to the number that people put on you. And, and there's something about that that's very, very scary because it's something you can't control at all. And you don't necessarily feel like it reflects who you are. You know, most people, if you ask if they feel like they're 35 or 45, they'll be like, no, I feel like I'm 25. What are you talking about? So it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's always been something that kind of seeing my loved ones get older and, and all those ideas, even as a little child were terrifying to me. And then I saw uh, both my dad and my granddad ended up in nursing homes and visiting them there was kind of, was really scary. And then, um, or really, you know, affecting emotionally. And I remember this one time and it happened with both my dad and my granddad. My dad had dementia, but my granddad still had his full head. He didn't up until the end. And, and, and this one time he, I'm sitting next to him. He's in bed. He looks behind me. He says, there's someone at the door. And they look around and I'm like, there's no one here. And, uh, and he said, no, 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 I can see someone in the door frame, just right there. And I'm looking and there's no one. And of course I dismiss it. And I just think, well, he doesn't see very well or he doesn't, you know, whatever it is. And that just made me think the first reaction is obviously, no, you're wrong. But maybe he did, there was a shadow. Maybe someone walked by, maybe just whatever it is. But my first reaction was to dismiss it. And that made me feel like that's the perfect setting for a horror movie because he's stuck in bed. Or if you still are able to move sometimes you're stuck in your room where you definitely can't leave the house because the, la the house is definitely locked and and people won't believe you so whatever happens in that house you're kind of stuck with it there's no help coming absolutely that's a great point uh i i think piggybacking off of that a little bit i think elderly characters in film and television uh especially those that are female are so often uh kind of one note you know they they rarely get to use spicy language um but I found uh, that the characters in your film, The Manor, they're, they're dynamic and depicted with dignity and respect. What did you do oh, to make good. sure, what did you do to make sure that Judith, uh, you know, played by Barbara Hershey and uh, the other residents at The Manor came across as three-dimensional and relatable? Well, that's the other side of it is that I feel like, especially as women, we have very few role models of a certain age. We have very few women you can kind of look forward to becoming you can when you're when you're 10 or 15 you're given all those models of what a woman should be when she's 20 or when she's 25 or when she's 30 but there's very little to aspire to when you get to like 70 or 75 when you look at the kind of entertainment that we consume because we always show them as being either very vulnerable or completely crazy or being kind of like would you like some tea dear you know <laughs> kind of very delicate and like i'm not gonna be that i swear like a motherfucker and, and there's no reason that would change with age. Actually, it got worse with age. When I was a teenager, I never swore at all. And then, and then somehow, you know, life catches up with you. There's a line that Judith says to her grandson that's kind of like, well, I fucking earned it. You're 17, so don't swear. <laughs> and, and they're like, this is, I think this is much more reasonable. And the, and the friends I have, I'm very good friends with Lin Shay, who is an absolute treasure. And she is so fun and so great and so much the kind of woman I'd like to become, and she swears all the fucking time. So um, it just seemed like it was more, it, it made more sense to me. And um, I don't know if the answer makes any sense here, but uh, but yeah, and then the funny thing is that when I would send out the script, people would say, old people don't speak like that. Old people don't use the F word. We're like, what do you think happens? People turn 65 and then suddenly like that language changes and their little finger lifts up and they only drink tea. Like what the hell is going on? <laughs> you know, so it was a little bit of a fight to get people to accept that. But I think it's much more, I would love to be someone like Judith when I grow older. I, I would too. And I love that you just, you know, like you said, kind of normalize, you know, the idea that you don't just stop swearing when you become a senior citizen, you know, that you don't just, uh, you know, everything about you doesn't just completely change when you hit a certain age. 
Uh, well, and that's the thing. It's like we, we seem to think that people, as they grow older, turn into something different, and they don't. And we behave like they're someone different, and they're not. And, and that's the scary thing is that it feels like your body changes, but your mind is still the same. And so the, all those things are what fed into writing the story. I think that's really neat. Uh, speaking of Judith, do you think in her younger years she might have been a Judy? Or would you say that she is a lifelong Judith? That she may have been a Judy? With do, you a, think, what do, you, do you think she went by Judy in her younger years, you know, when she was a little <laughs> more carefree? Or do you think she's always been a Judith? That's a good question. No, I think she's always been a Judith. I think okay. she's always knew who she was. Okay, I like it. I like that a lot. Maybe um, she was Jay at some point. Jay at some point. Okay, very good. <laughs> uh, so Axel, the film's runtime I found to be really short and sweet. And that's refreshing to my, you know, ADD brain. So uh, I'm just curious, did you have to cut anything out to get it so kind of sleek and trimmed down? Or do you feel like you really got to, you know, present everything that you wanted to uh, and were able to just do it, you know, quicker than than a lot of films do? <laughs> I, I really like short films. I like films that you can watch that don't feel like it's a massive commitment when you when you start them. But the reality of it, to be completely blunt with you, is that we only had 20 days to shoot. So there's only so much footage we're going to get. And, and if you want to use that time carefully, it's better to do with, uh, to do it with um, putting time into making things well instead of having a massive two-hour story that you try to cram into 20 days of shooting. Um, and 20 days, actually, <laughs> by some standards, nowadays seem like it's a lot, but it's really not. It's really not. It goes by so, so fast. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the answer is that we, we didn't, there was one sequence that was cut before we, before we filmed it. There was a big stunt sequence, strangely enough, where um, she escapes the house going down the wall and uh, I'm a climber. So I thought that would have been really, really fun to do, but so many reasons we couldn't do that, including the fact that we have a 70 year old actress hanging off the side of a facade that's on the listed house that you can't build anything onto. So it's <laughs> just, just not gonna happen. Sure, sure. That's completely fair. Uh, what about that ending? I, I, you know, without spoiling too much, I love uh, the way that you went a little dark. Did you ever flirt with the idea of a lighter conclusion? Or was that always, you know, kind of the, the plan? I, I find actually that the, it's the only happy ending you could find. Yeah, it's the only one that feels truthful to me and who, who Judith is. And I, I'm very curious to see how people will react to it because I know that it's polarizing. I know it because when we sent out the script, again, as much as people didn't like the fact that she swears, <laughs> a lot of people were opposed to the ending. And to me, that was a deal breaker. I'm like, I'm rather not make the movie rather than make the movie with the ending that doesn't feel truthful to it. It's just, this is who she is. And I think I'm at a stage of my life where I would make the same choice and where it's just, yeah, she, she's rebellious. She goes with what she... I can't say more without spoiling what it is, but but it just felt like, to me, that's the only way you can end this movie that feels right for the character, but also doesn't feel like um, a slap in the face for the kind of themes that we're establishing and where I'm at personally in my life. Absolutely. Well, I love that you uh, were true to her and true to yourself and, you know, fought for the ending that you felt like was authentic. I, I think it's perfect. And, you know, I would be shocked if people didn't respond positively to it. <laughs> we never know. <laughs> right. Uh, so shifting gears a little bit, I know from following you on social that you're a dog lover who often has your canine companion with you on set. Uh, does your good boy help you with the creative process or is he purely ornamental in all of this? <laughs> good girl. She's a good, good girl. Oh, good girl. Good um, girl. My apologies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she has a boy's name, but she's a, yeah. Um, you know, she has opinions about everything. She doesn't, she's a barkless dog. So it's, it's a breed that doesn't bark, but she will tilt her head and look at me like, and she has this little face that seems so inquisitive and so intelligent. And sometimes I'll see something and she'll just kind of <laughs> look up at me and make me think twice. No, but it's, it's, it's wonderful to get to have her with me. And it, it, she's the love of my life. And she's follows me in the office in pre-production and when we get the chance she's on set with me I just did two episodes of Midnight Club in Canada so she was with me and she was on set quite a bit sleeping on my lap while I was in front of the monitor it's just it's so calming we were dealing with very emotional material so everybody was happy to have a dog and, and do big emotional scenes and then have a little doggy cuddle it was 
was quite great. And now I'm on American Horror Story and she spends time in the costume trailer and while I'm shooting. And, and every once in a while she will walk on set and have a look and then be like, yeah, okay, I've seen this. Get away. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's terrific. Uh, well, my final question for you is this. Uh, as someone who's been around the film industry for a little while and, uh, you know, has seen things uh, take a turn for the better, hopefully a little bit recently with uh, women getting more opportunities behind the camera, uh, I would love to hear how you've seen things evolve, but also uh, you know, what we can, can continue to do to make progress and uh, make uh, Hollywood and the horror industry uh, a more inclusive place for people of all genders. Right, I think it's such a complex question. There's so much that goes into that. Um, it's not, I don't think that anyone ever set out to say, I don't want, not in recent history anyway, I don't want to hire a woman for the job, but there's so many misconceptions and so many, you know, you very often hear, execs or producers say I saw a younger version of myself in, in this so I wanted to help him and that's very rarely a man will very rarely do that to a woman and help a woman up there's just so many there's the kind of material sometimes that women are interested in that isn't seen as being worthy you know when people talk about when I, my first feature came out soulmate um I had websites literally say, this is a chick flick, guys. You don't need to watch this. And I'm like, it's not. It's, it really wasn't. Or I had people say, it's like, it's the fantasy of a bored housewife. I mean, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> it's, it was seen differently because it was made by a woman. And I think those things are changing. Maybe not as fast as I wish they were. I think also that we're seeing that there's a lot of women who do love horror and who do want to make horror. Well, for a very long time, people had this assumption that we didn't. And it's just that I also think that if you don't see someone like you in the job, it's very difficult to see yourself doing the job. I think that's also one of the reasons it took so long for me to realize directing was the thing I wanted to do. I always knew I wanted to be in horror, but it took me a while to figure out it's directing that's for me. It's always felt kind of unconsciously like maybe it was in my place. And I think that just everyone I had around me were guys. Everyone who wanted to make horror or who was a director at the time was was a man so all those things are changing and it's very exciting to see i just hope that we continue in the same in the same direction and it's the same with you know trans filmmakers or people of color it's just kind of seeing that those stories are valid and that different points of view matter and that um different stories are interesting it's enriching for the genre absolutely that's a terrific answer well thank you so much for joining me today thank you so much